The Japanese have accepted our terms fully. That is the word we have just received from the White House in Washington. And I didn't expect to hear a celebration here in our newsroom in New York, but you can hear one going on behind me. We switched to London. I don't know what happened. I'm not even sure whether you heard the first words of Prime Minister Attlee or not. I couldn't hear anything in our speaker here with the confusion. Suddenly we got the word from our private telephone wire from the White House in Washington. The Japanese have accepted fully the surrender terms of the United Nations. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the Second World War. It is not, of course, the official VJ Day, but the United Nations on land, on sea, on air, to the four corners of the earth and the seven seas are united and are victorious. No details yet. The news machine's beginning to tick away after a brief pause. Uh, we did not get that information from the press associations. It came on our private wire from the White House. Now it's beginning to come. Bulletin AP. Washington, August 14th. President Truman announced at 7 p.m. Eastern War Time tonight, and it stops Flash on the INS, or is it UP? MacArthur appointed Jap boss. Flash, MacArthur appointed Jap boss. Is that uh, UP or INS? Okay. INS, Beth, thank you. International News Service, I'd like to credit the sources. International News Service flashes the word that General MacArthur is supreme over the Emperor of Japan. He becomes uh, the Allied boss. The, U the AP, meanwhile, that I'd started to read has now started up again. President Truman announced 7 p.m. Eastern War Time tonight, Japanese acceptance of surrender terms. The AP does not use the word full, but our previous information did contain the word full, full acceptance. Paul White's coming to stand beside me with the, uh, the first take of Prime Minister Attlee's speech. And let us see. Mr. Attlee says Japan has today surrendered. Now down in Washington, uh, one of our Columbia correspondents who helped to get the news to us so quickly. Bill Henry is standing by. This is Bob Trout in New York. We're going to switch you quickly now to Washington. Bill Henry reporting. Bob, this is Bill Henry in the mobile transmitter just across from the White House, and I will read you the statement by the President, dated August 14th, 1945. This is the statement. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government in reply to the message forwarded to that government by the Secretary of State on August 11. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification. Arrangements are now being made for the formal signing of surrender terms at the earliest possible moment. General Douglas MacArthur has been appointed the Supreme Allied Commander to receive the Japanese surrender. Great Britain, Russia, and China will be represented by high-ranking officers. Meantime, the Allied Armed Forces have been ordered to suspend offensive action. The proclamation of VJ Day must wait upon the formal signing of the surrender terms by Japan. Following is the Japanese government's message accepting our terms. It's headed, Communication of the Japanese government of August 14, 1945, addressed to the governments of the United States, Great Britain, the Soviet Union, and China. With reference to the Japanese government's note of August 10th regarding their acceptance of the provisions of the Potsdam Declaration, and the reply of the governments of the United States, Great Britain, the Soviet Union, and China, sent by American Secretary of State Burns under the date of August 11th, the Japanese government have the honor to communicate to the governments of the four powers as follows. First, His Majesty the Emperor has issued an imperial rescript regarding Japan's acceptance of the provisions of the Potsdam Declaration. Second, his Majesty the Emperor is prepared to authorize and ensure the signature by his government and the Imperial General Headquarters of the necessary terms for carrying out the provisions of the Potsdam Declaration. His Majesty is also prepared to issue his commands to all the military, naval, and air authorities of Japan and all the forces under their control, wherever located, to cease active operations, to surrender arms, and to issue such other orders as may be required by the Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces for the execution of the above-mentioned terms. This is Bill Henry. I have read you the latest bulletins that have come from the White House front, and I return you now to CBS in New York. This is Columbia's news headquarters in New York. Our last great enemy is defeated. The Second World War is at an end. Ladies and gentlemen, 
our national anthem. Back again in the newsroom itself. The Second World War is over. To recapitulate very briefly, President Truman announced that the Japanese have accepted the surrender terms of the United Nations, accepted them fully with no qualifications. While our correspondent Bill Henry in Washington was giving us the details of President Truman's brief, dramatic, and supremely historic news conference, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Clement Attlee, was broadcasting to the British people. Uh, in a moment or two, we're going to let you hear the Prime Minister's words, but first, Mr. White's just handing, a, handing me a bulletin which says that VJ Day will not be proclaimed until after the formal signing of the surrender terms by Japan. The three allies in the Pacific War, Great Britain, Russia, and China, will be represented at the signing by high-ranking officers. The announcement today means the Japanese have said they will sign. They do surrender, and they will sign, but they have as yet not signed the document, so the surrender is official, but it is not formal. I think that is the best way we can put it. And now here at Columbia's news headquarters with Bob Trout speaking, uh, we are going to bring you the recording we were able to make of Prime Minister Attlee's words as the Prime Minister addressed the British people at this great moment and on this great day. Japan has today surrendered. The last of our enemies is laid low. Here is the text of the Japanese reply to the Allied demands. With reference to the announcement of August the 10th regarding the acceptance of the provisions of the Potsdam Declaration and the reply of the governments of the United States, Great Britain, the Soviet Union and China, sent by Secretary of State Burns on the date of August the 11th, the Japanese government has the honor to communicate to the governments of the four powers as follows. One, His Majesty the Emperor has issued an imperial rescript regarding Japan's acceptance of the provisions of the Potsdam Declaration. Two, His Majesty the Emperor is prepared to authorize and ensure the signature by his government and the imperial general headquarters and the necessary terms for carrying out the provisions of the Potsdam Declaration. Three, his Majesty is also prepared to issue his commands to all the military, naval, and air authorities of Japan and all the forces under their control, wherever located, to cease active operations, to surrender arms, and to issue such other orders as may be required by the Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces for the execution of the above-mentioned terms. Signed, Togo. Let us recall that on the 7th of December 1941, Japan, whose onslaught China had already resisted for over four years, fell upon the United States of America, who were then not at war, and upon ourselves, who were so oppressed in our death struggle with Germany and Italy. Taking full advantage of surprise and treachery, 
the Japanese forces quickly overran the territories of ourselves and our allies in the Far East. And at one time, it appears as though they might even invade the mainland of Australia and advance far into India. But the tide turned, first slowly, then with an ever-increasing speed and violence, as the mighty forces of the United States and of the British Commonwealth and Empire and of their allies and finally of Russia were brought to bear. Their resistance has now everywhere been broken. At this time, we should pay a tribute to the men from this country, from the dominions, from India and the colonies, to our fleets, armies and air forces that have fought so well in the arduous campaign against Japan. Our gratitude goes out to all our splendid allies and above all to the United States, without whose prodigious efforts this war in the East would still have many years to run. We also think especially at this time of the prisoners in Japanese hands, of our friends in the dominions of Australia and New Zealand, in India, in Burma, and in those colonial territories upon whom the brunt of the Japanese attack fell. We rejoice that their sufferings will soon be at an end. Uh, these territories will soon be purged of the Japanese invader. Here at home, you have a short rest from the unceasing exertions which you have all borne without flinching or complaint for so many dark years. I have no doubt that throughout industry generally, the government's lead in the matter of victory holidays will be followed. And that tomorrow, Wednesday, and Thursday, will everywhere be treated as days of holiday. There are some who must necessarily remain at work on these days to maintain essential services. And I'm sure they can be relied upon to carry on. When we return to work on Friday morning, we must turn again with energy to the great tasks which challenge us. But for the moment, let all who can relax and enjoy themselves in the knowledge of a work well done. Peace has once again come to the world. Let us thank God for this great deliverance and his mercies. Long live the King. Save the King has joined our own national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. The four principal allies are united tonight, the United States, Great Britain, Russia, and China, in complete and sweeping victory over the enemy Japan. We've not yet heard from China. We have a brief note from Russia. The Moscow radio has heard in London says that Emperor Hirohito has ordered all Japanese armed forces, wherever they are, to cease military operations, to give up their arms, and to follow the orders of the Allied Supreme Commander. That's from the Moscow radio, which has been keeping very quiet about uh, the surrender excitement of the past few days, which has been going on through most of the Allied world. Now our correspondent, who is at the White House in Washington, Bill Henry, is ready with more news for us, so we switch you now to Washington, Bill Henry reporting. This is Bill Henry down in front of the White House again. I wish that you could see the change that has come over Pennsylvania Avenue in the few minutes since we gave you the announcement regarding the end of the war. 
This great broad boulevard is just a river of humanity now. The automobiles are blocked down as far as the Treasury Department. So are the streetcars. We've had a tremendous scene here because just a few minutes ago, the wife of President Truman came out on the front porch of the White House. There was a tremendous surge of people across the street to answer her as she waved and greeted the crowd. She has since gone inside, but the excitement here is tremendous. There are two rather important items I think that I should give you before returning this. First of all, the president has ordered a two-day holiday for all government employees. That will be... You can gather from the sounds that there are some of them here. That will be for tomorrow and Thursday, and this action is to be without charge against the annual leave of the employees. They're all very pleased about that. The president also has ordered, and after, on the recommendation of the War Department, that selective service shall reduce inductions immediately from 80,000 down to 50,000 a month. This figure will be just enough men to support the forces required for occupational duty. He hopes to bring home five and a half million men in the next year. The president has now come out on the porch. Uh, the crowd are swarming across the street again, waving at him. He is up on the porch, waving at the audience. They are all, uh, it's a little difficult to see from here because the big fountain cuts off our view. But this is a perfectly magnificent scene. I wish I could give you more detail, but I return you now to CBS in New York. Back again in New York, at Columbia's News Headquarters, Bob Trout speaking. And as our correspondent Bill Henry was talking to you from the White House, we've been told here in our News Headquarters that a great change has come over the city of New York, too. All the pent-up emotion... Uh, which uh, gave way in some people during the last few days of long, suspenseful waiting, uh, but was held in check uh, in the majority of the population. All that pent-up feeling is now beginning to break loose, and no wonder. The second and last great member of the Axis, the last great enemy of the United Nations, defeated. President Truman out on the porch of the White House greeting the crowds, as you heard. Uh, perhaps I should... Uh, Perhaps I should uh, bring you up to date a little bit, just in case you might, after having stayed with us so long, have not uh, come in uh, promptly at 7 o'clock Eastern wartime to our broadcast. We've been going on here for hours and hours and hours, but at 7 o'clock, just 19 minutes ago, it finally happened. President Truman gave uh, the word to a news conference to the reporters at the White House. Prime Minister Attlee of Great Britain went on the air. It's official, it's complete, it's sweeping, there are no qualifications, the Japanese fully accept the surrender terms of uh, the United Nations. I would like to tell you that the president himself has not been on the air, nor has he actually given the proclamation which will set VJ Day. The president has given a news conference announcing this great victory news, but he has not yet issued his VJ Day proclamation, nor has he broadcast. We heard the broadcast of Prime Minister Clement Attlee of Great Britain. Columbia shortwave listening station in San Francisco just tells us that Tokyo Radio, in a special broadcast, says that Emperor Hirohito personally will read an imperial race script over the radio at 11 p.m. Eastern wartime. Well, there, we have quite a while to go for that, but undoubtedly we'll all be here uh, until at least 11 o'clock and way beyond it. 11 o'clock Eastern wartime, the Emperor is expected to go on the Japanese radio in person and read the admission of total crushing defeat for Japan. And also, of course, uh, it's a defeat which does bring out, I think we're all thinking right now, does bring out the fact that the decision to go after Germany first will certainly go down in history as one of the greatest military decisions of all time. The Japanese war, it can now be seen so clearly, was merely an appendage of Germany's war, and when the Germans were finished, the Japanese were finished almost automatically. And the boys who struggled and fought across the blue wastes of the Pacific Ocean, from island to island, did not have to fight their way into the Japanese home islands themselves, as they would have had to do if Japan had been first on the schedule. Germany would not have gone down so quickly, just a few days, more than three months, after the defeat of her Axis partner, if Japan had been the first to collapse. But Germany collapsed, and Japan fell almost of her own weight. Of course, the Russians entered the war. Of course, the atomic bomb was dropped. And I don't mean to disparage any of the great military developments or of the fighting qualities and the fighting achievements of all the Allied soldiers, sailors, and airmen in the Pacific. But it can be seen that Japan depended for her mad adventure entirely upon Germany. President Roosevelt, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, decided to fight Germany first and Japan afterward. And their decision will certainly rank as one of the greatest, one of the most momentous military decisions ever taken in the history of the world. 
Our correspondents in the Pacific Islands are listening to our news. We know that Guam has been listening to us because I've just had word that the first news flashed on the naval base, the island of Guam, was this, quote, CBS says it's official. CBS now says it's official. End of the quotation. That was the signal, I should imagine, for some very intensive celebrating. At any rate, this is the time to find out what is going on on the island of Guam. Our correspondents are standing by. I believe Webley Edwards will be the first to speak to us from Guam. So we switch you now to Guam. After a few seconds pause, well, I'll pause right now in the introduction. I'm not quite sure whether the switch is made ready. Ah, I see. I'm sorry. I'm about two minutes early. Guam will be up at 724 Eastern Wartime. It's just 722 Eastern Wartime. I didn't see the, uh, the figures there. Well, the uh, first news flash from Guam, as I said, was that CBS says it's official, and that was the signal for... Uh, Guam to go into its celebration. I think before 724, when we do switch, we've time now for a few words from uh, the celebrating center of New York from Times Square. So we switch you to Times Square. Charles Shaw reporting. This is Charles Shaw broadcasting from a balcony of the Astor Hotel overlooking Times Square. This scene here is almost impossible to describe. I have been told that there are at least 300,000 people massed here from 42nd to 49th Street in uh, Times Square here. It's really, uh, everybody here is just rejoicing at the uh, news that the war is over. Quite a few uh, naval officers are here, and uh, it's probably the noise of... Uh, the immediate noise you hear in the background. And uh, people are milling around here now. They they were rejoicing when they saw the signs of the uh, uh, on the New York Times news bulletin, the electric bulletin there, which uh, told them that uh, the Japanese surrender had been uh, received. But however, the first news which greeted the Times Square celebrators came from a uh, uh, commercial sign here on uh, Times Square, which uh, said, uh, Japan surrenders. And then they flashed the V sign, and uh, we were standing here, and uh, we pointed to the crowd to uh, look over uh, to the uh, sign there. And they all, uh, everybody, uh, cheered uh, very, very happily. Back again at Columbia's headquarters in New York. Guam is ready now, so without further ado, we take you to Guam. Webley Edwards reporting. Even after all the false ones, the official word came as a quick thrill. Early morning here, we've been celebrating in a semi-official way all night. Guam is definitely along with you in celebration of the end of the war. I just talked with a U.S. Army Signal Corps man named Eugene Cohen of Brooklyn. And he said, well, it may be over, but I still have to sweat it out going home. I hope I get home to Brooklyn soon. So now we've heard it's official. So now the last of the renegades gives up. Japan has found that the way of the transgressor is hard, that the wages of sin is death, that he who lusts for his neighbor's possessions must meet his eventual punishment, that the aggressor who makes war meets his end in war. Yes, old, well-worn phrases, those. But in this hour, they seem like comfortable thoughts to tie to. In a little while, the wild rejoicing and the bright shouts will begin. We will pound one another on the back. We will throw our hats in the air. Some will get drunk, and some will want to laugh and sing and cry all at once for sheer relief. But right now, this is the hour we've been waiting for out here ever since the morning of December 7th, 1941. Like the soldier who has just finished a grueling battle and lays down and falls asleep on his arms, a reaction of unutterable weariness comes upon us. I remember that morning at Pearl Harbor like it was yesterday. I remember the blackness in our hearts as the bombs fell and the Jap planes roared down the highways and strafed automobiles to pile them up in broken heaps. I remember the smugness and cockiness of the enemy. He had been pretty smart, all right. He had caught us napping. He struck with a sneak blow. He hurt us bad. We hadn't been ready. He found that out all through the Pacific as he spread out south and east and as far south as New Guinea and as far east as the Gilberts and Kiska and that too. And I remember the heartbreaking job that stretched out like some painful obstacle race before our leaders. 
and the men who were to go with them. And I remember the weary, dreary early days of the war when we knew we didn't have quite enough. But with that, not quite enough. We had to do it anyway. Then the fight back across the Pacific, while priority was given, and wisely we see now, to the war in Europe. Back across the mountains of New Guinea and up its coast and early carrier strikes at the outer fringe of Jap Islands, and the Solomons, Guadalcanal, Tulagi in Florida, and the rest. Then one day, Tawa and the spearhead in the outer armor of Japan. The big push was on. We're out here now in the Marianas, where we finally came in and occupied a base. We're close by Okinawa and Iwo Jima, from whence we sent this death to the Japs and finally forced them out. Well, that's the way it is here now. We're thinking about those hard days, and just a moment, we'll start celebrating. This is Webley Edwards. That's Guam. I'm... Well, now we're back in San Francisco and ready to hear from another CBS Pacific correspondent. For the reaction to victory from General MacArthur's South Pacific headquarters, Columbia takes you direct to Manila. John Adams reporting. The official news that Japan is willing to surrender unconditionally has finally reached Manila. Manila's not in a celebrating mood. The celebration started Friday evening about 9 p.m. Manila time when the first Tokyo peace proposal was announced to the world. With each new flight of the slow diplomatic peace pigeon between Washington, Bern, and Tokyo and return, there were new flurries of excitement, street parades, boisterous parties, and early morning headaches climaxed by the short-lived jubilee yesterday afternoon when Domai flashed the Tokyo decision to accept the Potsdam Proclamation. Rain, which is still falling, helps subdue part of the celebration, but most of the boys seem to feel that they have their biggest celebration yet to come when they hit San Francisco or any other U.S. port and the war will be over for keeps. Although it appears that the negotiations for peace have now been concluded between Japan and the Big Four, through the slow, tightly coated official and diplomatic channels, it will still be some time before we get Japan on the dotted line. We still have no inkling here at General MacArthur's headquarters just where and when that will be, and who may be the Allied Supreme Commander that was mentioned in Secretary Byrne's first counter-proposal. A few minutes before the official news was released over the radio by President Truman and Prime Minister Attlee, I phoned General MacArthur's quarters and told them CBS had tipped me off to stand by for an important announcement. One of his military aides was still a bit dubious, but said he would pass on the message to the general. The general was having breakfast. It is now 8.20 a.m. Wednesday, August the 15th in Manila, and it was the first information they had that the official announcement would be made shortly. General George Kenney, MacArthur's air chief and commander of the Far East Air Forces, was less cautious when I phoned him of our alert and said in a rather tired voice, I guess this is really it. The Japs are done. I asked General Kenny his plan, and he replied, that depends on the commander-in-chief, but you'll see me in Tokyo shortly. This is John Adams in Manila. I return you to CBS. And now back to New York. Back at Columbia's news headquarters in New York, Bob Trout speaking. Before we continue with our great victory broadcast, we're going to pause for 30 seconds for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Columbia's news headquarters in New York, Bob Trout speaking. Just before we pause 30 seconds for the station identifications from coast to coast, we were listening to our correspondent in Manila, John Adams, who told us that out in the Philippine Islands, they still do not know who will be the supreme allied commander in the Pacific area. But all the news associations here in New York have carried the story that General MacArthur is to be appointed as the supreme allied commander in the Pacific War Theater. We broadcast that news about two minutes after seven, I believe, very quickly after the original announcement that the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Great Britain have announced that Japan accepts the surrender terms of the United Nations and accepts them with no qualifications, fully, absolutely, and completely. Japan is finished, but the surrender has not yet been signed. Now, we've heard from Washington several times. We've heard from our correspondent, Bill Henry, in the White House, and now we're going to try another point in Washington. I'm not sure exactly what the point is, as a matter of fact, because our correspondent is in the CBS mobile transmitter in Washington, and he might be on almost any street in our nation's capital. At any rate, we take you now to the CBS mobile transmitter in Washington, Tris Coffin reporting. A tremendous, happy, wonderful, joyous crowd is in front of the White House, in front of the portico. The president has just come out. He's come out with his wife, 
and uh, he was all dressed in his, in his blue suit. He wore it at our press conference. Mrs. Truman came out with him, and seven other uh, members of the White House staff or cabinet. I think I saw Secretary Wallace and Dave Niles of the uh, White House staff, and they came out and came clear down to the General Marshall was there too, one of the soldiers told me. And uh, uh, the, the president walked down to the fence and saw one of his friends, the photographers, and waved to him and said hello. The president was very deeply moved. It was, it was quite apparent that the president was. He came down there and the crowds were out there just cheering, cheering him and uh, applauding him. And the streets out here in front are littered with confetti and people walking all around in kind of this careless, wonderful, happy holiday mood. In fact, a friend of mine, a major, uh, who's, who's been fought, fighting in the New Guinea campaign, just stopped me and said it's beautiful. And he, he said it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Uh, down the street here to our left, the trolley cars on Pennsylvania Avenue are all balled up because soldiers and, and sailors and even girls have climbed up on top of the trolley cars and, and uh, they, they can't get going. A few of them are going even with people on top of them. And people are milling all across the street. I've been in Washington for five years. I've never seen a crowd anywhere like this. We had thought that, that Washington crowds weren't really crowds that, uh, that uh, took off and celebrated. But this is a wonderful celebrating crowd. It makes up, as the president said, for the celebration we didn't get to have on, on VE Day. Now we have uh, kind of a double-barreled, uh, wonderful celebration on VJ Day. You can probably hear the trolleys clang as they go by because they have to clear a path through these people. The people are, are uh, walking about. There's no really wild shouting, but there's a happy look on their faces, and, and everybody's so glad it's, uh, it's over. I see a boy climbing a telephone pole to look see if the president is coming back out again. Uh, I look, there's the president out there now. The president's coming out again. And he's behind the door in the portico. You can see and the people are crowding up against there. The policemen are uh, waving their whistles. And the president is going back in again. He wanted to see those people for himself, I think. It really means a lot for a guy from Missouri who, is, who has come up the, the hard way, you might say, and to see the war end and see all these people out here in this marvelous demonstration not only for the president, for, but it really is a demonstration for the United States, its greatness and its, uh, its power and its, uh, and its people. Whereas I think that people are all here to, to demonstrate their affection for their country, and the president is a symbol of it. The, the White House flag is flying, is flying very proudly. I don't know whether it's true or not, but I heard the other day that they were going to put the, the flag that flew Iwo Jima on top of the White House steps, I mean on top of the White House uh, portico when the, celebra when the celebration was announced. You can probably hear the trolleys dinging by. There's no one inside them. Everybody's been on top of them all the time. And they're just beginning to move again. The police finally got them moving. Uh, besides the many, many soldiers here with battle stars and ribbons, there are also a lot of boys here with uh, discharge service buttons. And uh, I see all kinds of girls in uniforms. And uh, the, the White House, it's a lovely setting. Because directly in front of us is the broad portico of the White House. There are four beautiful columns, there are white columns. And, and uh, directly in front of them in the garden or the lawn of the White House, there are flowering red flowers. I think they're cannas. And then the people are climbing all over the fence. There's not a room any place in the fence. The cameramen are coming down there and taking pictures of them. And where this crowd comes from, I don't know. Because a few minutes before the president's news conference at 7, I looked out and, and they weren't there. They, they just seemed to come from nowhere. And then, and uh, uh, I see a car passing in front of us now. It's, a, it's a, uh, kind of a, it's kind of a uh, coupe or a sedan. No, it's a small sedan, a, a two-door sedan. They got kids on it and uh, people on top of it and girls. And they're throwing confetti at the streetcar. And people are waving. They're just, it's just a, a happy crowd. I've never seen a crowd happier in my life any place. Girls, just like where, where, where? where? Oh, just a uh, soldier said, just like Paris and, uh, on VE night in Paris. I bet it is. Uh, and uh, it's, it, I, I can't explain to you how wonderful it is because I've never seen anything like it any place. And I see out in front of us, too, I see some people uh, with Chinese faces. Uh, wandering in the crowds there, I see a, a man, uh, Chinese, with a uh, camera. He's wandering in the crowds, and uh, it's a rather warm night here. Uh, and the moon is, is in the sky, and there's a, it's a, it's a blue sky with a kind of a... Uh, faint ripples of white clouds in it. You see two birds flying overhead uh, just in front of the White House. Uh, the White House grounds now are bare except for uh, two policemen and some Secret Service men and the military police. They have to be quite sure, of course, that the president's life is, is protected. And uh, inside the kind of a, of a cavern in the White House door there, you can see, uh, I think it's the president's naval aide, Commodore Vardaman, uh, back there in that dark recess out there. Uh, 
I imagine the president is having a very wonderful time back there with his close friends because this is this is a great night for him because it's a great night for America. He is, as uh, Archbishop Spellman said the other day, a typical American. And nothing could be more American than this celebration here before us now. Uh, there's no attempt at all to control traffic. <laughs> you can't because the people are all the streets and uh, people are smiling and here waving at us here in the booth. And uh, uh, I, I, I see a few policemen walking by, but they don't, they're really not trying to uh, let any traffic go through. I think they, they stopped all traffic except, except uh, the streetcar that you hear clanging past here now. Uh, there's a little boy, a card boy behind with a flag. You want to get up on top of this mobile transmitter up here and wave his flag up here. I don't blame him. I'd like to do the same thing. But uh, the, the crowds are, 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 are... Now here come a crowd of boys and girls. They're right, right, right to our uh, right. And they're marching down the streets. And uh, I don't know whether they're singing or not. But they're kind of an order. They look like uh, bobby soxers to me. I don't know what they'll sing, but they're kind of all came in one, one big group. It's about... Uh, well, I'd say there are probably about 200 kids in there. And there's, there's a, a, a father with his uh, little girl daughter on his shoulders, and she looks like she's having a wonderful time. I suppose she's about four years old, and she sure remember this. Here come the, the young boys who look like about 17 years old, who they'll probably be in the armies of occupation, and they're singing now. They're on a kind of a chain gang. I don't know what it is they're singing. You know what they're singing, soldier? God bless America. Oh, they're singing God bless America. It's pretty hard to hear in this noise. Maybe you can hear a little bit now. No, I'm afraid you can't. It's all screaming and yells, but it's all very good humor. Everybody likes it and uh, is grinning at them and talking. And they're, they're trying to tell me something about where they're from. I don't know where they're from, but they're, they're, they're from some school down here. And they're Georgetown, Georgetown. They say it from Georgetown. Now they, I've said that. They can hear me talking out there, and they're saying it's okay. Fine. Well, they're from Georgetown, and they're all the circle around back of her now. I didn't realize that back of us for, uh, for uh, feet and feet and feet and yards back to the old cannons on the Lafayette Square uh, statue. The people gathered all around there. And some boys tearing up paper and throwing it in the air. The photographer's deck. Oh, hail, hail the gang's all here. They're singing now, right? <laughs> They're kind of an exuberance, but <laughs> this is the night for it. Those are boys they saw me from Georgetown. I... There are college boys, all about 18 or 19. The whole crowd joining in. I think they regard this place as the focal point. <laughs> They're all screaming, yelling here. I think, they, I think that this is, this is the place to celebrate since the president has gone inside. They decide to hold their celebration all around here. It'll flow around someplace else now, but they love it. <laughs> they, uh, oh, they're crying out, we want Harry. Well, I hope, hope he does come out. I, I imagine that you can hear that sound. We want Harry all coming here. The girls, I see some waves in front of me, and uh, the boys behind me, and the crowd's just packed and jammed all around here. They're shouting, we want Harry. They're getting a cheerleader out there, kind of does it in motion. Now they're singing those songs, God Bless America. I think the people in front are probably singing some other song, but they're singing God Bless America in back of us. And it's, it's actually all part of this wonderful, wonderful spirit that's come over the people of Washington on this VJ day. It means release from... I think somebody told me this afternoon, three and a half days of war. And it's, uh, we've been pretty sober and calm down here all the time and perhaps even a little bit grim. But now we've got it off our chest and it isn't, it's a kind of a happy, it's, a, it's really a happy celebration. It's, it's not a, a wild celebration or I don't, I've never seen anybody around who has the slightest bit inebriated. Uh, here comes a car down here now. There's a car policeman trying to <laughs> get the crowds away. To, car with a lot of soldiers on it and some girls and a sailor. Soldier up there is waiting. <laughs> I think he wants everybody to get out of the way so we can bring the car down this way. There are crowds coming from all over. Now they're coming. I see them down from our, to our left, down toward the, uh, I, know, I, was, I just happened to think because I was coming out of, out to the transmitter. I saw the, the man who was with Franklin Roosevelt uh, as his almost his, his personal bodyguard, the Secret Service man. I wish I'd stopped and talked to him because how Mr. Roosevelt would have loved this scene. Uh, this was the same Pennsylvania Avenue where the body of Franklin Roosevelt came down, I, well, it was last, last spring, I believe. And now this avenue this is filled with joyous people. It was the kind of thing that Franklin Roosevelt had dreamed about. I hope that somewhere that if there's a sight from heaven that Franklin Roosevelt can see this scene because he would have loved it. And I know the people that, that uh, were close to Mr. Roosevelt were thinking of him today because 
this, this celebration is due in part to him and his vision in, in seeing and planning all this. The, uh, this car in front of us, <laughs> they just can't move at all. Look, the policeman who's sweating, he sweat, sweats all through his shirt. He's shouting there and trying to get people to, to uh, get the car out of, get out of the way so the car can go by. It's moving about one foot a minute. I don't know where they're trying to go with it, but... <laughs> The, the soldier on there, he's, he's a Marine, I think. He's talking to the policeman. The policeman just, the policeman is very, very harassed. I don't think he enjoys this at all. This is a bad, bad night for policemen to get cars through. But most of them look pretty happy. I'm, it's pretty rare to see uh, happy cops on an occasion like this, but they're all happy. They're smiling, and uh, uh, <laughs> the only, one, only unhappy cop was one I saw with that, um, uh, that car. I see a, a sailor on uh, crutches coming by here. He's coming pretty fast on those crutches. And it's, there's some flags. There's some flags now out in the crowd. People are waving them. It's the same wonderful American crowd. It's the crowd of, I don't suppose, at any place you could find a city which is more typically American than Washington because we have people from all over the country here, people from Missouri and Kansas and California and Idaho and Vermont. And I, I even hail from two states, Indiana and Oregon. People from all over the, all over the country are here and they're all they were government girls and soldiers and sailors, and, but now they're just plain people. They're Americans, and this is their celebration. They all have, I suppose, boys. A lot of them have boys overseas. You've been listening to Tris Coffin describing the celebration scene in front of the White House in Washington, D.C. We return you now to CBS in New York. It's Bob Trout back in New York again while Tris Coffin has been talking to us from the CBS Mobile Transmitter on the street in Washington amidst the crowd. We've been getting news from various government agencies and the president himself is making some news. The president dispatched through Secretary of State Burns an order for the Japanese government to stop the war on all fronts. The War Manpower Commission abolished all manpower controls effective immediately, which gives the United States a free labor market for the first time in more than two years. The president also forecasts that more than 5 million men now in the army may be returned to civilian life within the next 12 to 18 months. The president said only the lowest age groups will now be drafted into the army, and preliminary estimates indicate only those under 26 will be called. The president has declared a two-day holiday for all federal employees in Washington and throughout the country, and he also made an impromptu speech on the White House lawn, telling the large crowd that this is a great day for democracy, marking the final triumph over fascism. It will go down in history as one of its most noteworthy days, said the president. The whole country should now unite in efforts to preserve the future peace of the world. That's what the president said to the great crowd gathered on the lawn of the White House on this, not the official victory day, but the day on which the world learned that Japan is surrendering and is surrendering unconditionally and fully to the United Nations. Our correspondent in London, Edward R. Murrow, is ready to report to us now. So from New York, we switch you now to London, Edward R. Murrow reporting. This is London. It fell to a mild-mannered little man, Clement Attlee, to tell the British people that the war had ended, that the last of the king's enemies had been laid low. He spoke in a dry, unemotional voice, very similar to the one that he used when he announced the Atlantic Charter. And once again, we have seen that the British people were right. For the last three days, they have been celebrating time after time. They have been told that the news was unofficial, but still, they continued to celebrate. We'll be telling you later in the course of the evening just how the celebration is building up here because it's now about 10 minutes to 1 o'clock in the morning. There is no official information in London regarding the composition of the Allied High Command which will rule Japan. It is known that General MacArthur will be the supreme commander. That decision was not made without argument. The argument occurred in Moscow. The Russian Foreign Minister, Mr. Molotov, and the American Ambassador, Mr. Avril Harriman, exchanged some very blunt words on the subject. The Russians thought the Supreme Commander should be a Russian. Mr. Harriman was acting and talking under instructions from Washington, and he refused to compromise or consider the Russian claim. The argument was heated and lengthy, and a couple of hours after it had ended, the Russians withdrew their suggestion and decided that they would be willing to have an American as Supreme Commander of Japan. There would appear to be nothing in this incident that is likely to impair Russian-American relations. It's simply an interesting footnote to fast-moving history and should not be exaggerated. Agreements are not reached without argument. Maybe the Russians never expected to win this one. But anyway, after advancing their arguments, they finally agreed. Their claim may seem to us presumptuous or arrogant or anything else you choose to term it. The important thing is that they did not press it to the point where joint action was made impossible. 
To the British people, the immediate reaction is one of relief that their prisoners will soon be coming home. It means a two-day holiday, as it will at home, and it means that a lot of people will be coming back, people who for the last three years have simply been an occasional postcard coming in through the Red Cross. But above everything else, to the people of Britain it means that the killing is over, that there will not be boys dying on coral sands and in the stinking jungles. And I should think that probably all over Britain, the meaning down in Devon is about the same as it is in Denver. I return you now to CBS in New York. This is New York, Columbia's news headquarters again, Bob Trout speaking. My colleague Ned Kelmer was on the street in the heart of Midtown New York when the great news came less than an hour ago, just about uh, 49 minutes ago, as a matter of fact. And Ned Kelmer has now come into our news studio and is ready to tell us what it was like to hear the news while being on one of the New York streets. Ned Kelmer. When the total surrender of Japan was announced at 7 o'clock tonight, I was on the street in the heart of Manhattan, right in the middle of New York, a few blocks from the Columbia Broadcasting Buildings at 52nd Street and Madison Avenue. And there couldn't have been a lapse of more than five or ten seconds after the news was flashed over the thousands of radios that had been on all day in all those apartment houses with their thousands of room. It couldn't have been more than a few seconds before every whistle and automobile horn in New York was blowing and the canyons between the skyscrapers were black, I should say white, with millions of pieces of paper and cloth that were swept upward like foaming geysers by the fresh summer evening breeze. In the midst of all this pandemonium, men and women thrust their heads out of the building's windows and shouted, It's over, it's over, the war is over. At the crowds down in the street and at neighbors to whom they might never have spoken before, because New York is like that, but who may have been living across the court or a few days away from them for the past 20 years. At the same time, just a few minutes after this tremendous spontaneous outburst of cheering and hooting and kissing in the streets had started, those thousands of radios in those buildings simultaneously began to blare out the national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, and hundreds of the radios were turned up to their loudest so they could blast out that grand old tune that never sounded better to American ears than it did here just an hour ago. And that's how America's biggest city first reacted to the news, in a spontaneous outpouring of rejoicing that will never be forgotten by those who saw it. Now back to Bob Trout. Uh, since Ned Calmer started here in our Columbia News Studios, we have some further word about uh, the order which the president dispatched through Secretary of State Burns, the order commanding that the Japanese government stop the hostilities on all the fronts. The dispatch was sent through the Swiss government and was turned over to the Swiss legation in Washington a few minutes after 7 o'clock. And this is what the president has ordered. First, that the Japanese government direct prompt cessation of hostilities by Japanese forces. General MacArthur, as Supreme Allied Commander, must be informed by the Japanese of the effective date and, and hour for the hostilities to stop. Second, that the Japanese government send emissaries immediately to General MacArthur with information on the Japanese forces and with full power to make arrangements as General MacArthur directs for the formal enemy surrender, which of course has not yet come. Third, that the Japanese government stand ready to receive from General MacArthur information on the time, place, and other details of the formal surrender. The text of this message by the President was released by the State Department about half an hour after it was placed in the hands of the Swiss Chargé d'Affaires, Max Grassley, who's been acting as the intermediary in the exchange of notes which began last Friday morning when the Japanese government sent the note telling uh, the governments of the four principal allied nations united in the war against Japan that the Japanese were prepared to surrender under the terms of the Potsdam Declaration and they wanted to know about the emperor and the emperor's prerogatives. They were told on Saturday, they claimed they heard only on Monday uh, what the... What the Potsdam ultimatum would mean for the emperor's future, and of course today they have announced that they will surrender unconditionally. There are no reservations in the note. That's the announcement that the president of the United States made less than an hour ago. It seems like many hours ago. These past 53 minutes have been so crowded. And Prime Minister Attlee of Great Britain went on the air. We brought you his words too, as he told the people of Great Britain that the last great fascist enemy, the last member of the Axis is now completely and thoroughly defeated. Japan is beaten to her knees. The Moscow Home Radio announced at the same time, 7 p.m. Eastern wartime, that Japan had sent the note accepting the Allied surrender terms. 
This broadcast was heard by the Federal Communications Commission, and, uh, of course, it wouldn't be noteworthy particularly because we know uh, that uh, the surrender note is in the hands of the Allied governments, but the Moscow radio has been very cautious and has not been telling the Russian people uh, very much about the tense weekend which the people of many other Allied countries have had as the interchange of information went on between the Allied governments and the Japanese government. The Moscow radio had said very little about it, and the Russian people, uh, perhaps, I don't really know, but perhaps they had not quite realized how near the total defeat of Japan was. Tonight they were told that Japan is surrendering. They were told at the same time, and this time... The arrangements for the release of the news did work as we can see. It must have been uh, announced simultaneously on all four Allied capitals. I hope it was. We haven't heard from China, but we do know upon receipt of this news from Russia that the Russians, too, announced it at the same hour, at the same moment. And uh, that's one time, at least, when the arrangements for simultaneous announcement and release of news do seem to work. Earlier, the Moscow radio said that the Soviet Union and the Chinese Republic had signed a treaty of friendship today, and that, of course, is extremely important, important uh, for the days which will immediately follow uh, the formal surrender, which has not yet been carried out. It has been agreed to, but it has not been carried out. King George is going to broadcast tomorrow at 4 o'clock Eastern wartime. That information has just come in. We expected that the king would broadcast. We did not know the time, and now the time has been set. 4 o'clock Eastern wartime tomorrow, King George will broadcast. The Moscow radio said today that Emperor Hirohito had ordered all Japanese armed forces, wherever they are, to cease military operations, to give up their arms, and to follow the orders of the Supreme Allied Commander. And the Tokyo radio came on, came on in a special broadcast to say that Emperor Hirohito personally would read the imperial order over the radio at 11 p.m. Eastern wartime tonight. I don't know how well we're going to be able to get the emperor's words, and we can't tell whether the Japanese really are going to broadcast what they say they're going to broadcast. If you were listening through the hours of last night with us, you'll know exactly why I say that. But if the emperor really does go on at 11 o'clock, and if... Uh, many people in the Allied world can hear the Emperor. It certainly would be a broadcast worth listening to. Or then again, perhaps it wouldn't. I'm not sure. At any rate, the war is over. The Second World War is over. President Truman announced it at 7 o'clock, and I'm just repeating it for you because it just is possible that although we've been broadcasting for so many hours here, uh, perhaps you just might have tuned in a bit late. And so I'd better tell you again that... The note finally did uh, come from the Japanese government to Switzerland. It was delivered through the normal diplomatic channels to Washington, just as uh, the President's Secretary Charles Ross had seemed confident that it would be during the long weekend vigil. It was delivered this evening around uh, 6 o'clock. Shortly after 6 o'clock, uh, the Swiss Chargé d'Affaires took the note to Sec Secretary of State Burns. Secretary Burns took it to the White House. The President called a news conference promptly at 7. Just a few moments later, it seemed, the correspondence burst out of the President's room, and we had the news almost instantly, and shortly after that, President a uh, Prime Minister Attlee was on the air telling the British people and also our Columbia audience that the war is over. That is, the Japanese have surrendered the to the uh, United Nations and have accepted the United Nations terms. They make no reservations uh, about these terms. They accept them, but of course they have not carried out the formal surrender. Bob Trout at Columbia's news headquarters in New York. I've been bringing you up to date as well as I ca uh, can on some of the things that have been happening in this very crowded hour which still lacks three minutes of being a complete hour, starting with the great moment of 7 p.m. Eastern wartime. I've just been informed that we can hear, though, what's going on in another part of New York, a part that is considerably noisier than our news studio here. So let's see or hear what's going on here in another part of New York. We take you to the CBS mobile transmitter, Larry LeSeur, reporting. New York has been liberated. They're going simply wild down here at 42nd Street and 5th Avenue. But this is an automobile celebration down here at 42nd Street and 5th Avenue. The cars are speeding past in a mad dash. Just hear those horns. People are hanging onto them too deep, really just clinging to the sides of the cars. The horns are wide open. Their precious batteries may be running down, but they don't care. All the office workers have gone home from this great industrial region, and they're probably celebrating in the great suburbs of New York and the Bronx and Brooklyn and Queens. And the streets down here are filled with holiday makers. And there are trucks from all over New York loaded down with vans and youngsters. Just hear them blowing those horns. These speeding cars can hardly stop for the red lights. They're equipped with bells, with Halloween horns. This is the greatest celebration I've ever seen. 
Greater than the liberation of Paris, I think. But the churches are filling up, too. Sophisticated New York isn't so blasé as they say. St. Patrick's Cathedral is filling up with people when I came past. Everyone is walking somewhere in every direction. They don't seem to care where they're going, but all they want to do is keep moving. But more than anything else, this is an automobile parade down here at Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street. There's no trouble with the crowds. They're all surging forward, probably going over to Times Square or uptown. They're shouting from the tops of the buses. People are shaking hands. People are kissing. People are embracing. This is New York at the end of the Second World War in a frenzy of excitement, wild with joy, expressing their pent-up relief, enthusiasm, and getting rid of their wartime inhibition. This is Larry Lester returning you now to Columbia News Headquarters in New York. Back again in our news headquarters in New York, I think it's just about time to pause briefly for station identification. We have not uh, had a station identification for some time, so I just want to tell our stations across the country that that's what we're getting to do, getting ready to do right now. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Columbia's news headquarters in New York, Bob Trout speaking. My colleague, John Daly, who's been very busy on the other side of the glass wall in the newsroom itself, has now entered our Columbia News studio, his coat off and his hands full of notes and papers, and this is an appropriate time to turn the microphone over to John Daly. And now, while Bob Trout goes out to the newsroom to catch up on the facts that are piling in so fast on our teletype machines, I'm going to take over and report to you the things that have happened so far. The big day, the big night has come, and the mind is sort of empty of all sorts of things, and facts rattle around. It's very hard to get back on, remember just what was said at what place, even though the great news came only an hour ago. So perhaps the first thing we can do is, for those who have turned in late, uh, is to very briefly state what happened at 7 o'clock this evening. Then President Truman, at a press conference in the White House, told the correspondents that the war with Japan was over, that Japan has surrendered unconditionally. And the president announced it, as I said, at 7 p.m. Eastern War Time tonight. He said that General of the Army Douglas A. MacArthur has been designated the Supreme Allied Commander to receive the surrender. He said that offensive operations have been ordered suspended everywhere, and he said that V.J. Day will be proclaimed only after the surrender has been formally accepted by General MacArthur. President Truman added that he regarded this surrender as unconditional. The Japanese note, however, directly followed one from the Secretary of State, Mr. Burns, in which you'll remember the Allies agreed that the Japanese would be permitted to keep their emperor, at least for a time. The Burns note prescribed that the emperor should be completely controlled by the Allies, also that the Japanese people should have an opportunity later on to decide by ballot the kind of government they want. When that note went to Japan on Saturday, there was a great deal of argument as to whether or not we had compromised the declaration from Potsdam. A good many people hadn't made up their minds uh, even as late as this afternoon as to whether or not we had compromised our statements from Potsdam, which added up to unconditional surrender from the Japanese. But a close study of that uh, message from Secretary Burns last Saturday really shows that if we're willing to accept the fact that the Emperor of Japan has been a helpless tool in the hands of the military jingoist leaders of that nation, then indeed he is not in the true sense a war criminal, and we can leave him on his throne and have the added advantage of using him to bring about the surrender of the great masses of Japanese soldiers who are spread all over the Far East and who are also massed in the home country. Now that is the news as it came from Washington at 7 o'clock tonight. It's perhaps very, perhaps very fitting that this news should come on the fifth anniversary of the Atlantic Charter. And it brings back to mind the very great part that the late President Roosevelt played in this triumph which we are celebrating tonight. Without detracting for a single minute from all the credit which goes to President Truman for the wonderful job he's done since he's taken over our country, we can remember on this anniversary of the Atlantic Charter that it was President Roosevelt who on that day started America into real cooperation with her allies who turned all of our great force and our power to the cause of justice and righteousness, who later led the country into the war which we have now won, both in Europe and in Japan. President Roosevelt also, you know, is responsible in a very real sense for the atomic bomb, for the fact that Russia declared war on Japan, the two great stunning blows which finally brought Japan to her senses 
and finally brought Japan to her knees. And so it's well in all the celebration tonight, in all the gaiety which America has a right to, in all the heartfelt gratitude and thanks which is pouring out of a very grateful 130 million people to remember that the late President Roosevelt deserves a place in our minds, a place in our thoughts, and also a place in our prayers as we go into our churches to give thanks to our God for what has happened on this night. <laughs> 